Hello, Jen, and Hi. everybody. Oops, I've got some feedback here. Hang on, everybody. Hello, Stay Jen. Out. Cool. Well, welcome, everybody, to our virtual STEM curriculum. Uh, my name is John. I am OSEARCH's uh, communications manager. Uh, thank you all for being here. We know we changed up the time on you at the last minute, kind of. Um, we found a way to start to revamp this platform that we're working on, and we wanted to make sure that uh, we could include as many people as possible and that it ran as smooth as possible. Thank you all for um, adjusting uh, the time. Uh, just want to let you all know that we do have a chat window uh, at the bottom. Uh, just below this video. So if you have any questions, um, I, my name is Osearch John's comm manager down there. I will be monitoring those questions. Um, I'll be answering some of them in there if I can so that I don't have to interrupt Jen, who's our education ambassador, who will be presenting this. Um, or I will either save them to the end or if it's very pertinent, I will interrupt Jen and ask her uh, the question. So please take advantage of that um, chat window at the bottom to ask questions. Yeah, are you getting some static over there? No, I don't have any static. Uh, will someone send us a message? Are you guys hearing uh, static? Let's see. Uh, okay, no, we're, I think we're okay. So with that, um, everybody, this is Jen Cotton. She is our education Hi. ambassador. Jen, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Sure. Um, so I am a high school marine science and AP environmental science teacher in Florida. Um, I've been working with OSEARCH for officially on board for four years and been interacting with them, uh, using them in my classroom for about nine years. So I've um, been out on a bunch of expeditions, have done teacher workshops and STEM camps, and also have helped with the curriculum. So, Hey, Jen, do me a favor. Will you do me a favor and mute your mic and let's see if it's coming from your end. Thank you all for being patient while we... Sounds like perhaps the static is coming from Jen's end. So just double check for me, Jen, that, um, do you, one thing, Jen, to check, do you have the presentation open somewhere else where you might be hearing uh, some feedback? So I guess close out of any other window on your computer where the uh, video might be coming in. Otherwise we could hear the static or the double. You're still muted. I only had it on this one screen. I had my phone near it, so I moved that. Did that help? Let's see. Maybe my phone was causing interference. Is that better? Sounds, yeah, that would sound a little better. Okay, so maybe my phone was causing interference. So, Jen, do you want to introduce myself? Okay. Um, I'm a high school marine science and AP environmental science teacher in Florida. Um, I've been working with OSEARCH uh, an education ambassador for four years and have been working with them as far as using them in my classroom for nine years. Very good. And do you want to introduce the course plan that we, the STEM curriculum, a little bit about the OSEARCH education platform and a little bit about what we're going to be doing today? Okay, so we have a whole bunch of different um, STEM curriculum that is up on the OSEARCH website right now. So if you go into the education tab on the website, you can download a lot of free lesson plans. We have upward of 100 on there. We also have curriculum packets for our expeditions, as well as different activities that you can do with your kids um, at home or in the classroom. So there's a lot that you can do with our curriculum that's available, and it's all free to download. We also do STEM camps while we're on expedition, as well as teacher workshops. We can do ship tours with kids. So there's a lot of opportunities that are available that are free of charge that you guys can interact with OSEARCH and spread the word about sharks with us and learn all kinds of different things. So um, do you just want me to go ahead and get started? Absolutely, thanks, yeah. Okay. So one of those platforms um, we're going to be talking about is ocean pollution. So we do have an entire packet dedicated and lesson plan uh, that's been created for ocean pollution. You can also find a lot of this information in our Earth Day packet if you wanted to get more involved with different ways to help prevent pollution from getting into the water. 
Um, and we're going to focus specifically on the acidification process today. So what's going on with the ocean as far as ocean acidification? How does it happen? You know, you may have heard that term a few different times, and we're going to learn exactly what that means. So to get started, we're going to go over some basics of to what pollution is and different types of pollution before we get into the nitty gritty of, of ocean acidification. So um, ocean pollution is any type of contaminant that goes into the body of water. So it can be a wide range of things from plastic that you guys are probably used to hearing about. Even noise pollution is considered pollution when it comes to the ocean. So different sounds that are put into the water can impact species like whales and dolphins that rely on echolocation for uh, travel and hunting. So that can be when light pollution is another one that impacts the ocean. Um, we need the light to be a certain way for sea turtles to make their way to the ocean. So it's not just substances, it can be uh, broader things as well. Um, some big, big ones that we're going to talk about um, are point source and non-point source. So point source pollutants are the ones where you can identify exactly where those are coming from. So this can be something like a massive oil spill where we know a tanker ran aground and caused a direct spill into the ocean. So with that, we can figure out how to stop it, we can clean it up, and we can help work towards finding a solution for that current environmental problem. Um, the bigger issue though, our non-point source solution. So I can go back, I'm sorry, thank you. So non-point source are items that we don't know exactly where they're coming from. So this can be um, fertilizer runoff, which we talked about the other day. Um, we did dead zones, we had a talk all on that, and we talked about fertilizers and how they were impacting the ocean. Uh, it can be plastic, it can be heavy metals, and today what we're going to look at is carbon dioxide and the way that it um, absor gets absorbed into the ocean and the problems that that is causing. Next slide, please. All right, so just to give you a little briefing on the pH scale, just in case, you know, depending on what level you're at in your schooling, um, pH scale ranges from 1 to 14, 1 being the most acidic and 14 being the most basic. So seawater falls right around an 8. So that is the optimal pH for the ocean. And then you can see on this chart, it gave you what, you know, fresh water is. So we have pure water, which is a 7. That's going to be a neutral solution. So that is going to be one that's not acidic or basic. It just falls right in the middle. And then you can see another water-based substance like acid rain that falls much more acidic on the scale at about like a 4.5. Um, so those substances give you an idea of the wide range of water. So water can have acidity, you know, in the whole scale because it's a universal solvent. So it can take in many, like anything and dissolve it into uh, water. So it can cause super basic solutions and it can cause, you know, very acidic solutions. Something really popular right now is like alkaline water that people are drinking that has a more basic pH. So water varies greatly. And I wanted to bring that up because we're going to look at the way that it absorbs carbon dioxide. Um, so I gave you at the bottom there the uh, what pH actually means. So it's the overall concentration of those hydrogen plus ions. So the more you have of that, the more acidic that your solution is going to be. So please keep that in mind as we go forward into the actual acidification process, because that's the one of the big science takeaways that you can you can get from this. So go ahead for the next one, please. Okay, so we're going to talk about CO2, how it moves from your car and turns into carbonic acid. So I'm sure you may have heard that, you know, CO2 gets emitted from your car um, and that can cause a lot of issues. So it can cause problems with air pollution um, and then it can also cause problems with the ocean. So your car during combustion is going to take that carbon that's within your fuel and it's going to um, to bond with the oxygen in the air to form CO2. So when your car emits that CO2 into the atmosphere, a lot of it is actually going to get sunk into the ocean because it's a massive carbon sink. So it will take a lot of it in. 
So we will release the, car, the CO2 from the cars, and the more that we have out there, the more CO2 is going to be released, the more it's going to be absorbed into the ocean. So this can cause a wide a range of issues. So on the next slide, we're gonna look at what happens um, specifically with the chemistry of this. And I gave you a little chart to follow just because it is chemistry and it's a lot of things happening. So at the top left, you can see where the CO2 is as far as the atmosphere goes. And then we're gonna move over to the, to the right. So we'll go left to right on this chart. So CO2 is going to be in the atmosphere and then end up being dissolved into the ocean as carbon dioxide. Once it's in there, it's going to combine with water, which is H2O. So now we have CO2 and H2O in the water to form H2CO3, which is carbonic acid. So that, you know, that car to carbonic acid piece. Um, what's in there, a couple of things happen. So it can have uh, bicarbonate ions, which um, organisms need calcium carbonate in order to build their shells. So at this point, it's starting to take away from some of that calcium carbonate that allows for organisms to build their shells. And it's also going to then split into hydrogen ions, sorry, hydrogen ions and carbonate ions. So now we have extra H plus ions in the water. So when we talked about on the last slide, the more hydrogen plus ions you have, the more acidic that it gets. So the more CO2 absorbed into the ocean, eventually you're gonna end up with an excess of those hydrogen plus ions and our ocean is going to become more acidic. So you can kind of click Real on the next slide. Again, there was a question in here. Um, is mm -hmm. the CO2 from cars different from the CO2s we exhale or is it just a much larger amount caused by the cars that's an issue? Um, carbon dioxide is carbon dioxide. It's oh, it's the same regardless. The problem is that there's so much of it um, with the cars that are being released. So when we breathe it out. It's not the same amount that's coming out with our cars. So it's not that you know driving is a huge problem. You shouldn't drive, but you know reducing that carbon footprint and cutting back really helps out with the situation. So it's natural. You know, it's a process that occurs when we breathe. So it is. It's the same thing as the cars. It's just this is on a much greater scale. Okay, any other? Okay, um, so this can impact marine life in a bunch of different ways. So, you know, on our OSEARCH website, we have quite a few different organisms. We, you know, mainly have quite a bit of sharks, but we also have sea turtles, uh, whales, you know, we have some dolphins and seals. Um, so we have quite a bit on there. We even have some alligators that you can look at. Um, so with the sharks specifically, what we're gonna look at is sharks live on coral reefs. Um, and they're what we call an indicator species and they tell the health of an ecosystem. So with the sharks around, you know, they're gonna have a healthier coral reef because they're there to help keep the food web in check. So sharks are around corals, keeping them healthy and in turn corals also provide an area for the sharks to feed. So when corals are compromised, our sharks can also be compromised. Go ahead, the next slide. All right, so our coral species here. So corals have something called a symbiont on it. So it's a little critter that has a, a, a mutualistic relationship, um, which mutualism is a type of symbiosis where both organisms benefit from the relationship. And this um, Critter is called Zozanthelli. So it is a microscopic algae that actually is what is keeping corals alive. Um, they are working very closely with each other and that microscopic algae, so you can go to the next slide. Um, so this algae is what's actually going through the process of photosynthesis. So it's going to uh, nourish the host coral and keep it um, available so that it can form its skeleton. So this, this has some of these nutrients onto, and uh, a lot of them, and they can have enough light and that will allow for them to thrive. So with this, that's why corals are found in that, you know, more shallow tropical waters because they get an excess of sunlight and it allows for them to thrive in that manner. So when the Zozanthelli seals 
threatened or they are in an area that is not conducive for them to do well, they'll actually leave that coral host and leave the coral to be a bare bones, which is where we get coral bleaching happening. So you can go to the next slide, please. So the image on here shows you what bleached out coral looks like. It is called bleached because it turns into this white skeleton because that uh, vibrant algae has left. Um, so a few different things can happen with this. So a combination of rising temperature and acidification lead to stress, which causes this process to happen. Um, another issue with corals um, uh, would be the sunscreen problem. So sunscreen has a chemical in it called oxybenzone that is actually threatening coral reefs as well. So that's another thing that can cause um, some ocean pollution that we have control over. And corals are having a lot of issues with both of these. So acidification is creating this big problem where they're starting to bleach out and then the entire ecosystem is going to kind of crash out. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So we're going to look at something called a trophic cascade. So when you take out a main um, species that keeps everything aligned, such as sharks, um, you have something called a trophic cascade. So it's a phenomena where you take that top predator out and everything else is going to crash below it. So if the corals are becoming unhealthy, sharks are going to leave. Other species can start thriving. You know, we can have different types of algae come in because we pull sharks. They're going to take out that you know level below them and eventually lead to organisms such as sea urchins and um, starfish that are keeping all that algae in check and they can explode and take away um, the food sources and then they'll die off from having an uh, unhospitable area and then algae can then bloom so we end up with just these dead unproductive areas um, so when you lose coral, something similar can happen as well, where that whole ecosystem can crash out because there's no homes or housing um, and food source for a lot of these different species as well. So real quick, Jen, just a couple of two questions here. Um, one, is there an alternative to sunscreen that you can use that won't cause bleaching of the coral? And then another question here, uh, does the bleached coral decompose or does it remain with structure once it's bleached? So for the sunscreen, there's a lot of companies that are already on board with not using oxybenzone. Um, mineral sunscreens are starting to become a lot more popular. Um, like Sunbum is a, is a company that that's what we buy all the time just because it doesn't have it in it. And a lot of them are becoming a lot more aware of this issue and are labeling things like marine life safe, coral reef safe. So when you're shopping, it's just smart to be an informed consumer and pay attention to what you're buying and looking at the different products to make sure that they don't contain those chemicals. It's not sunscreen as a whole. It's that one specific piece to it. So just make sure when you're purchasing it, you have Marine Life Safe listed on it and just double check the ingredients. Um, there's quite a few companies that are smaller creating these products as well that you can start purchasing to help. Um, the trick with that, though, is make sure you are applying it a little more often um, because if you don't, you know, you get a little sunburn. So just apply a little more often if you're buying those more natural products. It still works just as great, but you want to make sure you're still keeping yourself safe as well as a little marine friends. And then as far as the corals go, uh, the, the those and Sally can actually come back. So say it is a time when it's just a really extremely hot week and they will uh, leave because of that. If it comes back down in enough time, they can actually rejoin back in with the corals to have that relationship going back on. Uh, the skeletons will be around uh, for a while. In fact, we went to the Keys about two years after a bleaching event and coral was still around. So it is uh, just like seashells at the end of the day, it's calcium carbonate. So that, that structure will stay there for quite some time. Um, if it becomes way too acidic, which we aren't at those levels quite yet, it will break down eventually, which we'll show you in um, this at-home lab that you guys can actually participate in if you have the materials, or we'll give you, I'll give you a couple alternatives to make it more, you know, quarantine friendly, so you can use products in your own house. So, go ahead to the next slide. So, getting back into that, there is a little project that I like to do with my marine science kids. 
where we actually watch ocean acidification happening. So we will build up an environment over time that leads to acidification occurring in just a small amount of water. So what we did was um, we actually created a document for you guys that is a very modified version of this lab. And if you have questions about it, you can email the education at OSEARCH email and I will jump on there and try and answer all of your questions for the lab. Um, but Um, but anyway, that's where you can find the activity that Jen is about to discuss. Thank you. Okay, so the uh, driving question are what are the effects of CO2 emissions on calcium carbonate? So this first picture, this is not part of it, but I wanted to show you the idea behind what's going on. Um, this is step one that we normally do. So the beaker on the right has a little bit of, I actually go get water from my local estuary, so it is a uh, pH of normal seawater. Um, so you can just use regular water for the purpose because over time the pH is going to drop regardless. Um, but just to keep it a little more real in the classroom, this is what I use. So if you're a teacher, this is something that you can use as well. Um, and in that, you'll notice that it's blue. That's because it has an indicator solution within it that once you have um, the carbon dioxide hit it, it turns into this yellow color. So you can see on the right hand side, I have a little cup taped into the other beaker. In that cup, we mix vinegar, we put some baking soda in it first and then pour just a little bit of vinegar and that caused a reaction that releases CO2. So those bubbles, like when you made your old school volcano, um, you know, for your little science projects when you were kids, like science fair, everybody makes a volcano, that reaction actually creates carbon dioxide. So in the cup um, on the right, you can see that it has turned yellow and that is to show my students that yes, in fact, this, this activity that we're doing is releasing carbon dioxide. So on the next slide, um, you can see the results. So this is after a two week study. Um, I gave you information to do it for a week. If you wanna continue it, the longer you do it, the more of a issue or result you're going to see. So on the right hand side, I have a piece of just regular chalk for a chalkboard that is placed in just general seawater. So you can see there's a little bit of flaking on that and that's really just from us putting it in the container. It has been like that since day one. But then on the left hand side, you can see two weeks after having this CO2 absorbed into the seawater, the results on that piece of chalk, which is calcium carbonate, which is um, the same thing as the shells on our sea creatures and also on the corals. So on the left, you can see a huge crumbling of that chalk. In fact, you know, one of the tasks is to measure it at the end. And a lot of times when we go to try and pick it up out of the water, it simply just crumbles. Um, so we do our best to weigh it in a different way, but yes, it is, it is a major change between the two of them. So they'll take pH over time um, and, and see how it goes. So everybody's varies a little bit. So your results, like I said, that is after two weeks. If you just do it for a week, it may not look exactly like that or if we're using different chemicals and that's okay because that's science. We all work together and have different results and then we can see how it goes. Um, so I have time for some questions if anybody has some. So one of the questions that just came um, is what, it, can you remind everybody what the ideal uh, pH level is for salt water? And I also want to make note that Stephanie uh, from OSEARCH just dropped the link um, to the experiment. Uh, I yeah, the lesson plan, sorry, uh, into the chat box for everybody to download um, and follow along. Um, so there, anyway, back to the pH. Uh, what is the ideal pH level of salt water? Do you actually, can you go back to the slide that has all the pH scale on it? And I will go over a couple of things on there again. Okay, so on this one, the uh, for the seawater, eight, eight and a half, what we usually end up with towards the end of it is about six and a half. So after two weeks, it dips down to about six and a half. Uh, vinegar alone is about a 2.4 on the pH scale. So it's very, very acidic. Um, and you, if you don't have vinegar, you can drop like a little bit of lemon juice into the water over time. Um, you can 
Amazon pH strips if you really want to get into heavy with testing the pH. But in general, just watching the process of it breaking down will, will be a lot for you to see happening. So we started at about an 8, 8.5. So if you are going to start testing your pH and you want to create your own salt water, try and hit it around there. If you have a salt water tank at home and you have a refractometer, um, you can check your own pH, um, look at your, your salinity levels. So if it's at that, you know, 38 parts per million goal, you'll probably have an ideal uh, salt water solution for the pH to start with. So another question here is, um, can you unbleach coral once the process is, has kind of started? Yeah, actually there's a really amazing program going on down at Moat Marine down in the Keys that they are replanting corals and repopulating them on the reef um, in order to have the corals grow and replenish. So there's a lot of really interesting research going on out there to help bring coral reefs back. Um, so like I said, if conditions bounce back ba uh, fast enough, they will naturally come back on their own, but there are a lot of people that are helping. Uh, a few years ago, there was a lot of information on the Great Barrier Reef bleaching at a really high rate, and some of that has bounced back on its own as well. So it can come back, um, but there are people who are helping for areas that are, are kind of at a point where they just need that assistance. Uh, any chance um, you can talk really quick about man-made corals and what impact those have on helping ecosystems? So there's a lot of different artificial coral reef structures out there. We have quite a bit actually right off the coast where I live. Um, and organisms are going to naturally populate to those areas. We have fouling critters that will grow on them, but they aren't the same as having these actual corals. So an artificial structure is going to create something a little different. You have more like sponges and critters that are called fouling organisms, so they like to grow. But you're not going to have something like you would see in Australia where it is that um, symbiotic relationship. Um, at least not at the beginning. It takes a very, it takes a very, very long time for corals to grow like that. But artificial structures uh, work in order to help with ecosystems um, and bringing back different fish populations to the area. Um, I actually had a student of mine that created uh, oyster reef falls, and he's doing a lot of work with ocean acidification, where he's actually found some ways to combat it by adding some calcite back into the water, and it's really bounced back that pH. So there's a lot of different research that's going on to help with, with this issue. But artificial structures, that's something that are very common. Um, you may have heard of people like downing airplanes. You know, the, the Titanic is a gigantic artificial reef down there. So a reef's just anywhere where all of those things are gonna populate. Uh, two quick questions here. Um, Wanna, somebody asked, I mean, obviously coral, generally looks in some cases like a plant, but does it come from a seed? How do you grow coral? Because it's not the same process as like a tomato, right? Correct. Um, well, they're Nigerian, so they are something similar to like a sea anemone. So they're these tiny little polyps and then they have that relationship with that those ancelli. So they're going to grow naturally and they're going to have that calcium carbonate structure that they will actually live in. So it will grow over time um, and they like to live all next to each other. So that's how they get so big, but they have to have that symbiotic relationship in order to like feed. Um, so they're not going to eat on their own. So it has to be a combination of being able to build that, that calcium carbonate structure along with that symbiotic relationship with the zosin belly. So there are a couple of questions that have come in again about, you know, can you unbleach chlor? Can you unbleach coral? And I'll just kind of re-sum up what Jen said. And Jen, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but yes, but it's a very long process. If once the coral yeah. becomes bleached, um, basically all those little organisms living there, the algae, and it's all gone. So it's going to take a lot, uh, a long time to, to bring that coral back to health, which leads to another question. Um, you know, what can do to help sort of protect the coral and the acidification of the ocean um, from home. Okay, 
So the first thing, like, um, if you want an easy way to help uh, is just cut back on carbon footprint. Um, so we've, it's, it's not just cars, you know, things that you use are, are produced in factories that also is contributing to it, you know, using plastic bags, those are produced in factories. That's the way that you can cut back. Uh, be mindful of the products that you're buying. So like we discussed with the sunscreens already, you know, look to make sure you're using marine life safe sunscreens. That's one of the really big direct ways um, and very easy switch to make. So it's just reducing your carbon footprint. There's actually quite a few websites. So you can just do a quick Google search on that looks at your carbon footprint and then it will give you ideas of how to actually cut back on that. And a lot of them aren't, you know, we're not telling you to not drive your car. Um, I know where I live, if I didn't have a car, I probably wouldn't be able to go really anywhere because everything's so far apart. But there's a lot of things that if everybody just does a little bit to help reduce, we can see a really great impact. And something really interesting that's happening right now while we are all in quarantine sitting in front of our laptops or our phones, wherever you're at, is the CO2 emissions are naturally decreasing right now just because people aren't going anywhere. So for me, it's going to be really interesting to see the results on a lot of these environmental issues in the long term, um, depending on how long this goes on. So there's um, there's a bunch of cool websites that you can go to. I can't think of them off the quick top of my head because I usually just do a quick Google search um, that you can look at all those levels as well. So um, people just staying home has a direct positive result right now on the environment, even though it's been a little rough on us all kind of just staying home and, and hunkering down. But yeah, so just reduce your carbon footprint, uh, be mindful of the products that you buy, and um, clean up the beaches when you're there. Um, do just a quick 15 minute walk. Um, I challenge my kids to do a 500 step project and they just go out, do 500 steps, pick up as much trash as they can, and then that's what they do while they're there. So just get back to the ocean, be mindful, and check out your, your carbon footprint and see where you're at. Okay, there's a couple of questions here. We have kind of reached our 30 minute mark. Um, there was a quick question mm -hmm. about whether or not uh, uh, pollution from factories affects coral, and it does. Um, it is, you know, lots mm -hmm. of different chemicals can come out of uh, factories that can ultimately end up in the ocean, correct, Jen? Um, so there's that, but yeah, so go ahead. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's a universal solvent, so it's gonna take anything in that's in excess that the atmosphere doesn't already absorb. Very good. And then I did see some questions over here about the lesson plan and the one that um, that Stephanie put out there. I don't know where the mix up came from, whether it's a six through eight K through 12 or what the the, um, the course plan is. Um, but is it the ocean pollution one? It's the ocean pollution six through it's, eight. Yeah, it's labeled six through eight, but it can be um, used for for all grades and then the lab that we're gonna we put out is um one that i do on the, the high school level so it's a little mix of the two of them just to make sure everybody can have a little piece of it very good um what, what if we don't live near the ocean another way we can help like she said uh limit your carbon footprint is a way that any, almost anybody can help the ocean because basically the ocean is this big sponge that will you know suck up like Jen said, anything that the uh, the atmosphere cannot. So even if you don't live near the ocean, you can absolutely have an impact on it just by limiting your your carbon footprint. You can uh, limit your use of single use plastics so that it's less likely to end up in the ocean, and so on and so forth. You can still uh, use the sunscreen too if you're swimming in freshwater area because it will, it all does run off eventually down into the ocean as well. So you can still partake in that too or when you're on vacation. Do electric cars give off uh, the carbon? Some hybrids do. Um, some that run directly on energy, they do not. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that they are exactly carbon neutral um, because the batteries do have to get charged in some way, but they are a big step uh, better for the ocean. Um, so good question there. Um, guys, we do have to start wrapping up here. I do see a lot of questions um, coming through. Uh, we are very glad that you are so engaged. If you didn't, if there are some questions um, that you did not get answered, um, I will jump into the chat question or to the chat over here and try and go through and answer some of them for you really quick. I do want to say thank you very you much. Also, 
Um, I would say if they want to go to the Facebook page under the post about this, if you want to put your questions there, I can go on and go ahead and answer them there as well. Thank you for doing Thank that. Yeah, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll try to do our best to get your questions answered. If you do have any questions um, in general about all of our different STEM curriculums that we offer, um, because there's a lot for lots of different grades. Um, osearch.org slash education. Um, you can find all of our different STEM curriculums. They are a great way uh, to continue learning from home, uh, like we all are right now. Um, but uh, we are planning to try and do more virtual classrooms. Um, we are working through the kinks as we go. We're trying to make them better each time so that we have fewer fewer kinks, um, but thank you all for being very patient with us at the beginning while we did work the kinks out of this one, um, and we'll get better next time. Stay tuned to our social media channels. That's where we'll be letting everybody know uh, when the next education or uh, virtual classroom is coming. Um, so we're so glad that you all joined us. Thank you very much. Jen, anything, any last words? Yeah, just thank you so much, and I'm so excited how many of you want to learn about the ocean and OSEARCH you know, on this break. So we really appreciate you guys joining us. And we really look forward to the next one. Bye.